action. Hi everyone, I'm Beth Johnson, and with me as always is scientist Frank Marchis, and this is The Grudge Report. We're continuing our special 10-part series on the best of Stargate SG-1. We're covering one episode per season, as chosen by Stargate fans on GateWorld.net. This week's show, however, is just a little different, as we're covering Season 6, Episodes 4 and 6, Frozen and Abyss. Frozen was a special request from Grudge Report viewer Jonas, and it is the first part of the story that continues in season six best episode, Abyss. So we're combining them together today. Hello, Frank. How are you doing? I'm good, Des. How are you? I am good. My son got his second vaccination shot and is uh, having a rough day. <laughs> <Good. laughs> I mean, well, yay for being vaccinated, but boo for not feeling all that great. <laughs> he's going to drink water and it's going to be all right. Yeah, he'll be fine, but that's it's it's good that he's not in here. So it's it's very quiet in my house today, which is nice. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 the thing the one of the reasons that we're covering these two episodes is I sent you episode six and this is what's on the list. And you watched it and replied, There's not a lot of science in this. And I said, Okay, well, we have a viewer request for this episode for four. And so you watched that one and went, yes, this will work. Let's do them together. And I went, okay, and watched them four and six and said, oh, well, yeah, they're, they're, they're like one episode. They're one storyline. So this actually ends up working out really great. So thank you to Jonas for the suggestion. You actually made this show better than it probably would have been otherwise since um, really episode six, Abyss did not have a ton of science. There's a couple of things we will talk about in that. Um, this pair of episodes starts out in the Antarctic, which is fascinating in and of itself, and is where a lot of our science is going to come from today. Uh, the team is basically called to the Antarctic outpost, uh, where they are researching where the other Stargate was found, where the other dial home device was found, and they have discovered something in the ice. They think at first it's a frozen animal and no big deal, and then it turns out to be a big deal, and it's actually a frozen being right so we think they might be an ancient we don't know um i i learned a lot of weird terms from this I, again neither frank nor myself are biologists we are planetary scientists so we're going to talk about stuff that we don't necessarily understand a bit in this episode but we we do our research so <laughs> so frank what's the first thing that you want to talk about for this one uh what what came to mind for you well, the first um, in the first five minutes of the episode, they explain where they found this uh, human being look like some this species, and they say, "Well, uh, she was she's probably coming from an area deep into in the ice, uh, and she's probably fifty million years old." So maybe we should explain how we find how we correlate. Uh, ice and year, that would be kind of interesting. How do they know that she's basically been buried 50 million years ago? I, I know this one a little bit because as, a, as, as having to take planetary science, we both, I'm sure, did a little bit of paleontology work because that, that falls under the world of geology. So one of the things that they do is they test the oxygen ratios. So there are two different oxygen isotopes that are prevalent here on Earth, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. And depending on when in the planet's history you are, those ratios have been measured. So when you take an ice core and you can go back and say like, well, this is what the ratio was in that ice at that time, you can guesstimate pretty closely when in history that was. So that's, and that's what he says. He says, we measured the oxygen isotopes in the core and we came up with 50 million years, which is, you know, obviously it's a big deal because humanity wasn't around 50 million years ago. So for there to be someone who looks like a human in this ice at this time. Now the numbers change a little bit later on in the show and they basically say the new ice cores that they brought back were 3 million years old, still too old to be humans as we yeah. know it, but not quite 50 million years old. So what do we know about Antarctica in that 50 million year window, first off? So 50 million years ago, and once again, I found this online because I don't know the geological epochs by art. Uh, we were in the Eocene. It's uh, Eocene, an epoch yeah. between, between uh, 56 million and, and for 34 million, basically. Um, 
one of the main characteristics of the Eocene was that the climate was different. And this is mentioned in the show. They say Antarctica mm -hmm. was not cold at the time. So right. I check. Um, so interestingly, Antarctica existed, meaning that the distribution of the continent were more or less the same, and Antarctica was at the South, South Pole. So it was already, it could have been cold, in fact. But during the Eocene, we were in this, um, in this epoch which, for which the weather was significantly warmer. Uh, we talk about probably 10 degrees warmer because of uh, the different composition in the atmosphere. Mm. Um, so the Eocene, the, uh, paleontologists love those kind of uh, name and events. So I look, uh, the Eocene started at the PETM, which is the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. And, uh, and the temperature, in this moment, the temperature was uh, increasing because of uh, mm -hmm. higher uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then during, uh, when the, the, um, the time reached the Eocene Optimum, which is 40 million years ago, the temperature started dropping again. So what happened is that based on this modeling that they have of the climate at the time, they, ex they expect, they estimate that Antarctica did not have ice on the continent until basically uh, 34 million years ago. That's, wow. yeah, the ice, ice sheet appeared very late, in fact, in the evolution of our planet. <laughs> so when this person, a color person, um, was on Antarctica at the time, Antarctica had a vegetation, which had vegetation, a climate which was more hospitable than it is right now. So maybe people were living on Antarctica. I mean, no, I'm joking. Nobody was living on Antarctica. No people, no human being were living on Antarctica. But that do right, know. maybe, maybe, maybe. You know, we have these ancients that we are, we're discussing in, in the yeah. really purposes of the show and science fiction could have been, you know, obviously could have been there at the time. I like the fact that they chose a period of time, which is a good period of time for which we knew that there was a climate, a good climate on Antarctica to put those ancient. And uh, it's coherent. I appreciate the coherence into the in the in the in the science fiction show, of course. Yes, good job, science advisors. <laughs> so, so we find her. Um, she she is not. They they start like trying to thaw her out just a little bit to figure out what's going on. And they find that her cells have not been damaged by being frozen, which is unusual. And it's stated in the show that this is why we can't do uh, human cryogenics because the cells get destroyed by the ice crystals. So they're not feasible for thawing back out. Um, I hate to tell everybody this, the same thing happens when you freeze meat in your freezer. So just FYI, <laughs> uh, we are meat sacks. We don't freeze well. Um, but that's not the case with her. And I learned I learned the term adipocere, which is uh, which is the what builds up on the cells on the the body um, mm -hmm. as it decomposes. So it was it, that was sort of horrifying, but cool. You know, I like new terms. Um, but she doesn't have any of that. In fact, you know, they shine a light in her eyes, and her her eyes die. You know, her pupils contract, and then they dilate, and and she's actually showing reactions. So they thaw her out, and this is always problematic thawing out people that, that didn't exist around your species. Uh, and of course, the, the, the predicted results, I mean, really, anybody who's ever watched science fiction can see this coming, is that she sets off a virus. And um, she has amazing healing abilities, both for herself and apparently for everybody else. So uh, Again, from, from that personal standpoint, I'm amused that everybody's wearing masks, that they're now in quarantine, yeah. and all I can think is thanks, episode. Thanks. Thanks for that flashback to last year. <laughs> so they've got a virus. It's not bacterial. Antibiotics aren't working. I'm like, wow, this sounds so familiar today. Okay, yeah, please keep them on Antarctica. Let's not release this out into the wild. And uh, so she heals everybody but Jack O'Neill, which is very important for the second half of the show. So we will we will get to that. But um, did you do any research on on viruses uh, for this episode at all? I did a lot of research on this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot. I read some articles, very interesting article, in fact, and I is one of them, which is 
uh, I loved it because it's kind of it, 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 they try to drift us away of the panic mode, like uh, Earth is warming up, uh, Antarctica and Antarctica is becoming um, is um, is melting, so we're gonna have viruses and bacteria and non viruses and bacteria coming to our planet and destroys humanity and civilization. I've seen some of that. There's there's talk of uh, uh, permafrost where um, bodies were buried from the 1920, 19, the Spanish flu era uh, will be released and that will be back out in, in the world. And, and there's, there's a whole actual genre of fiction around it. Yeah. And, and I've, I've read a couple and, and wow, they can get really out there, but sure, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's a uh, possibility. It, this example you gave is a very good example. Um, they, um, when when the scientists of our modern town wanted to understand the 1998 uh, influenza, the Spanish flu, uh, what they did, uh, they went to uh, see bodies that were bur buried in the permafrost of, um, I think it was in Alaska, I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. And they analyzed those to try to find the virus, to understand what's the, what was this virus that killed so many people at the time. And they found pieces of the virus. Because what happened, and that's something say a lot in the article, is that when you are in a permafrost, when you put a body, a human body, an animal body, in a permafrost, uh, the body is not free, uh, frozen forever at minus 20 degrees Celsius and stabilized. In fact, the body uh, kind of thaw and, and uh, freeze again, etc. And this cycle, and that's a very important part of, this, of, the, of the article. This cycle is known to destroy viruses and bacteria. So they say in the article, if you, want, if you have meat from the, um, from the freezer and you're not sure it's, it's a good meat, you can unfroze it, froze it, unfroze it, froze it, unfroze it this multiple times, and you will kill all the bacteria and viruses in it. I don't recommend to do that, by the way. I'm just not sure it's a good idea. <laughs> no, again, again, ice crystals destroy the cellular tissue, which breaks down the meat, which means it's not necessarily good to eat anymore. Uh, it might be safe to eat. I don't know as it's going to be tasty. Maybe you're not going <laughs> to die of a sickness brought by the virus that were initially in the meat. You may die okay. of the fact that the meat is not good for you, but that's that was not the same <laughs> different... questions we had, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's That's a whole different issue. Okay. <laughs> All right. So sorry. that was uh, sorry to that, any vegetarians watching. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> so that was a, that was interesting uh, uh, first test, and then um, I read also that it did happen that a new sickness, not a new sickness, but a new type of sickness uh, appear. We call that an outbreak uh, because of of this, and this happened uh, for anthrax in uh, Siberia in 2016. Uh, there is the, uh, the carcass of a reindeer full of anthrax bacteria melted, reappear, and people die or got sick around it. And they have to put oh. the village in isolation, in quarantine, to try to minimize the propagation of the sickness. So it did, this, hap this happened. It did happen for bacteria. For viruses, uh, uh, something important here is that this... Um, this was only 10,000 years old reindeer, okay? It was basically not 3 million years old. It right. was a very new, uh, kind of a recent carcass of a reindeer. Um, okay. And then uh, there is this study by the French res researcher Jean-Michel Clavery and Chantal Al Abergel from the University of Aix-en-Provence. In 2014, they managed to... Uh, revive a virus that was stuck in the body of an animal, I forgot which one, which was 30,000 years old. And they, oh, wow. they revived it, and it was still infectious. But this is one of these gigantic virus. It's not a very, it's not a common virus. It's a big virus that they, as big as cells, basically, that infect oh. amoeba and oh. not human. Okay. So the reason uh, they, they, they say in the paper that they managed to do this is because the body, I forgot if it was, what kind of animal it was, was deep. It was buried 100 feet below the surface. 
So in this case, we didn't have the cycle of freezing thaw that we see uh, when you close to the surface. So it was really well conserved, basically. The, there was a perfect conservation of this, uh, of this body. And that's the reason the virus survived for 30,000 years. Wow. So yeah, that's, okay, so that's a, a little scary, but okay. <laughs> So, so not unheard of that something could survive. And, and as we noted that one, her body isn't being destroyed by it. So it's not as if her cells are breaking down. So she's obviously, whatever's going on, there's no like thawing and freezing going on for her. And they're saying that, you know, they're, they're comparing this to an ice core. So she's from deep under the ice. So there um, is one, one thing more I wanted to say. There is this okay. catastrophic scenario and I'm pretty sure we're gonna have soon a movie with this kind of story, so get ready for that, is the story of melting glacier. So in this mm -hmm. case, uh, you can imagine that we have glaciers are melting right now on Earth because of the mm -hmm. elevation of temperature. It's clear, we see them shrinking, right? And right. those glaciers formed millions of years ago for some of them. So inside those glaciers, there probably there is bacteria and viruses that did not does not exist anymore on our planet, but they're conserved. So here the scenario, the worst case scenario, is that inside those glaciers, which are stable and low temperature, we have one of these pathogen virus that can destroy the biosphere or human being, okay? The thing melt, it warm up slowly, it goes from the bacteria go from spore to being alive again, spread in the water, and spread through the cryosphere of our planet, killing everyone. Oh. That Don't could be like, the worst case scenario, okay? And 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 as we and as we have discovered, um, that whole trope of of government officials not listening to scientists, um, not not as far fetched as we originally thought, huh? Yeah. Okay. So so in the in the land of horrifying thoughts. All right. So we she spreads this virus to the people who are in Antarctica. Then she heals most of them at great risk to herself. At that point, and of course there's a blizzard, there's a requisite storm that has to roll through and they can't get rescued until that's over. So they finally get rescued. They get all of the, the CDC stuff happening. Disease control comes in, um, probably not CDC since this is a top secret government facility, but something like that. And they're rescued and taken back to Stargate Commands where um, Jack is now in the infirmary, uh, Ayana's in the infirmary, Ayana doesn't make it. Sorry, again, spoilers, people. We we have spoilers in this show, and and the only way and and she didn't have the strength left to save Jack, right? So she's healed everybody else, cured them of this virus, except Jack, who is now basically in a coma and dying. And the Tokra show up and offer him a symbiote, which we all know how Jack feels about this prospect. So Sam, of course, insists that. They ask him, so they they give him some epinephrine to wake him up enough to answer. He first says no, um, but Sam being Sam convinces him and he says yes. And end of episode as they take him off through the Stargate to Tokra headquarters to do the procedure. So episode five, I didn't watch. It's it's kind of a throwaway but, episode in, in between these two. Did you watch it? No, I did not, but I want to mention okay. that. It's okay. really great to talk a bit about the virus. For comparison, it's amazing to me how quickly they learned about this virus while they were um, in the in, a, in this uh, compound, basically. It, yeah. Look at the amount of time it took us to understand about the virus last year. It took us a year, mm -hmm. a year and a half to understand how it propagates, etc., what it does. But basically, for this one, in less than a week. Uh, the doctor found about how to, uh, what was the way of propagation, uh, what will be the in, in, in the long-term effect, uh, meningitis, something like this, basically. Uh, spinal, and, spinal meningitis. Basically, yeah. she carries it in her body, and her body, her healing powers are strong enough to fight the virus while it's inside her until she depletes her white blood cells, which are what our immune systems use to, to fight off disease. And when hers are depleted from fighting it off for everybody else, they can no longer fight it off in her and it basically kills her. Yeah. So, and uh, she's, um, so she dies of this uh, sickness and uh, O'Neill could have also die of that. And that's why we have this uh, symbiote of the Tokra. 
So let's continue the story. Okay. So, so I mean, relevant, relevant to our own time, you do make a very good point that, that while in reality, we now know it does not take a week to figure out how a virus works. <laughs> it takes a lot longer than that, as it turns out. Um, thankfully, we never see them really develop a vaccine, or that might have been even funnier to us now. Yeah. Um, so end of episode, they go through the Stargate. We start the next episode off, and it's very confusing. And you realize that it's Jack with, and his, his, his symbiote escapes, runs away to die, because if it doesn't have a host, it can't survive. Um, and Jack is captured by Ball. Welcome to the series, Ball. Cliff Simon, we miss you. Um, but this is one of our, our first real like, oh, here's, here's Ball. And he's, he's not a nice guy. He's a cool old. <laughs> So he wants to know why Atokra, Jack, is there. And Jack is going, I don't know. The last thing I remember, I was sick. It's that they could put that in me, and I have no idea what's going on. Ball's not buying it. There's a lot of torture, a lot of back and forth. Um, best things about this episode for me were Daniel shows up in his ascended spiritual here, not here kind of form, which apparently involves wearing a very comfy sweater. Mm -hmm. um, and he's basically there to try and get Jack to ascend, which I thought was hilarious because like, it just doesn't seem like something Jack would want anyway. And he makes it pointedly clear that he kind of doesn't. He just wants Daniel to save him. Um, but there, and, and as you said, there wasn't a whole lot of science in this episode. It's a lot of them trying to figure out where Jack is, what's happened, why nobody knows what's going on. And a lot of torture, ooh, a lot of torture. Um, but there was very one very elaborated one, thing. by the way. The torture is not the very simple one, the very sophisticated, I would say. Yeah, yeah. There, well, okay. So there's kind of two cool science things in this thing. One is the sarcophagus, which continues, which is a is a very long time story thread um, throughout Stargate, which basically heals any damage to your body simultaneously. The more you use it, the more your mind gets destroyed. So. Jack's been in and out of it as a part of his torture, basically, you know, take him down to a point where you have to heal him, heal him, bring him back. Eventually his brain is going to crack and that's Daniel's worry is that this torture will continue until there's really nothing left of Jack to save. So that's, that's kind of interesting. I like, I, I've always sort of liked that concept where it's like, yes, you can be healed all the time, like, you know, from disastrous stuff, but there's a catch. There's always a catch. Science always has catches. The thing that I, I, I found fascinating in this episode, though, was that they played with gravity on ball ship. Yeah. And that was kind of cool. Now, we obviously can't do that because that's one of those things that we're still trying to figure out this whole artificial gravity thing. Um, but they managed to switch the direction of gravity for Jack's, for the prisoner cells, which was kind of neat because it's like you can't break out because you can't climb out. So you don't even really have to do anything. <laughs> like there's no barriers, there's no anything. What What did you think of this? What did you think of this gravitational shift that they had? I was really trying to understand how they could do something like this. And frankly, even theoretically, I have no idea. <laughs> Same. The I'm like, wait. direction of gravity. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's not by rotation. Because I mean, no, and it's just it's created, just in a pocket. Uh, yeah, yeah. We know how to do artificial gravity for a big space like that, but we don't know yet how to do gravity change gravity very locally because gravity. And we and we we don't know how it would affect people yet either yeah. because that's one of the things. Uh, I I was watching a lecture with someone I think, and they were talking about how the effects of artificial gravity because you're spinning and the acceleration is different at different points would actually really affect how humans would handle it. That our bodies are used to gravity being in one direction all the time at basically one, you know, one acceleration. That's it, right? We've 9.8 meters per second down, right? That's it. And so to have it where it's actually rotating and that's causing your gravity, that's a constant acceleration, but in different directions. So your velocity is changing the whole time and that becomes that you know scientifically the, the things that that could do to the human body is very interesting now on the other it hand it's a psychological else way as well because you see some if you are in something rotating 
if you look outside, you see the thing rotating. So it could be very uh, perturbating to be a, to be standing on the surface and see everything rotating around you. I don't know how our internal here will not be able to adapt to that. Yeah, and and so I've, I've I have seen some scientists say that the human body is also amazingly resilient and very adaptable, and that after a short time could probably figure this out. Just sort of how astronauts do uh, in microgravity that you yeah. know they do adapt and they do get used to it, um, and that there is an a, you know a, a readaptive process when they get back to Earth and have to get used to full gravity again. So it's it's kind of interesting and i do like how they show jack figuring it out like the first time they kind of put him in there and then they turn the gravity different you know he falls. he falls and then the first time they come back to take him out they turn the gravity back and he falls and then after that he's like no i'm not falling again so he like stands in position stands ready for the gravity you know right he like lays on the floor until it's now the wall and you know he figures it out so you know and again i think that does show that there is that human capacity for for wrapping your mind around it eventually. I mean, and, and Jack would say he's not the brightest person, but he figures it out. Yeah. So, and so that's that's kind of interesting how they do sort of show that, yeah, no, but you do get used to the, the changes. Like you can figure out how this works. I don't know how scientifically how it, it would work <laughs> to, to do that. But again, civilizations that have been around for far longer than we have are, are one of those things we worry about. <laughs> But it would be oh, great over. if you could find a way in the future to do this because that will allow us to do uh, space travels and all of this. So, because that's one long of the long term, long term high speed space travel would be yeah. a great thing to figure out. Um, where's my warp drive? Anyway, uh, <laughs> so we're, we're, we're glad to be back. Sorry for the delay in this one, it, it got a little confusing around some timing. Uh, Anything else you want to add about these two episodes, Frank? Or did we kind of cover everything? No, I, I just want small details that I kind of make me realize that the episode is evolving in time because when they're back to Earth in the last scene, one of the last scenes of episode six, we see flat screens. You remember the first <laughs> the first episode that they, they still had this, <laughs> how do you call that? Dioptic the screen or yeah the the yeah, big huge. the big one uh, yeah yeah and an apple computer and now they have flat screen and and you can see the evolution of the technology of the 20th century through the show in fact they even have colors on the screens and windows and so on so it's starting becoming more more, more and more modern in the in the right yeah. that's we've that's we've, we've we, we've we've kind of I feel like I think at this point we've rolled over into the 21st century in the show itself. So it's it's where we feel a little bit closer to now yeah. uh, than when when it when it first started. So that that is true. That is a very interesting detail. I did not notice. Um, I think it's kind of that it's sort of like when you were talking about how you don't notice when I speak French to you. It's you know, you're so used to it. So to me to see a flat screen, I didn't even it didn't even <laughs> register with me that that was that that was weird in, in this context. So. Um, yeah, it's really, and I, I was kind of impressed with the, the technology in Antarctica, like the, the size of their research dome, um, the amount of things that they had. It's hard to send stuff to Antarctica people. It is yeah. very difficult to do. It's, it's, as they said, that C-130 comes down, drops off and goes away. So there's not a lot of time. And I'm, I'm kind of amazed that, you know, the, when they're talking about how the electronics on on the plane are affected by the cold, that they still manage to get the snowmobiles to work. So obviously they they've dumbed down the snowmobiles to keep them at a minimum of of, of tech of electronics. So um, yeah, there was definitely very interesting. I have I do have a, a friend who who has done Antarctic research, and uh, it is a challenge. So it's impressive how they show that they've like worked around it in this this particular dome. So. That was kind of a neat place to to get an eye an eyesight into. Well, I think I think that's pretty much it. I think that yep. covers both episodes. So um, we will be back next time with season seven, and uh, so stay tuned. Take a look for us there. And as a reminder, uh, SETI Institute is a five hundred one c three nonprofit, and we do these out of the donations from all of you. So if you are interested in supporting our education and outreach, please go to SETI.org and uh, look for the donate button. Um, 
and we appreciate your support and we will see you all next time. Thanks so much for watching everyone. Bye-bye, Beth. Bye. Bye, everybody.